Hey, thank you all, and thank you for being patient. I am sorry. Um, we got way more island in the bottom part of Ohio. Literally, I can see campus, Marshall's campus, from my house, um, and thought, you know, an hour and 50 minutes will be enough time to get from there to here. It is not uh, this morning, um, so it took over 50 minutes to get from a seven minute drive from my house across the bridge into uh, West Virginia, so that was fun. Um, there's an accident right there, so don't go out that way. Uh, well, hopefully it'll be clear though. So thank you all for being patient and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so a little bit of context um, behind some of this work. So uh, Marshall Health has a large initiative, um, the Division of Addiction Sciences, we made it a whole division, um, and that's actually where I'm housed, and I help coordinate all of our community-based programs. So that includes things you might have heard of um, or might not, like Project Hope for Women and Children, um, a residential program that allows all pathways to recovery um, and includes women and who are able to bring their children and then facilitate recovery there for a four to six month, 24 seven um, recovery program. Um, I help the city of Huntington coordinate the quick response team. Um, we help with Project Engage, which is increasing medication assisted treatment, both in the inpatient and the ERs. Um, and then we assist with programs like PROACT, the one-stop shop, um, where people can be triaged immediately upon walking in um, with all pathways to recovery. Um, and then other partnerships like CORE, creating opportunities for recovery and employment. We love our acronyms. Um, and so that helps is gonna be launching um, in 22 counties to help uh, create new pathways to employment, um, and employment engagement and job training. Um, and we're making that sort of more formalized. We're starting that just in the first four counties, the Cabell, Putnam, Canal region. Um, and then if you're in Cabell, Putnam, Canal, and Jackson, and you're not involved in Great Rivers Regional Partnership, that's another initiative that we're helping create a continuum of care across that whole pathway. Um, and then we have a, another initiative down in Southern Coal Fields. And so there's lots of things going on. Um, and so hopefully there is hope in regards to many of these programs and, and many ways to get the word out. So um, we want to talk a little bit about that, but the easiest way to start anything um, when we're talking about substance use, and I just heard um, Lisa talking about it, is um, to contextualize this conversation. So what figment of our imagination has the power to isolate individuals, to encourage people to deny a fatal illness, um, keep desperately ill people from seeking help or assistance, block funding for all but a small fraction of those who actually need it, and persuade our society to choose far more expensive alternatives, such as incarceration, loss of human life, um, the custody, uh, uh, removal of custody, or the um, keeping of children by the state right now, and such a cost on the state of West Virginia. All of those types of things fall under that. Um, and so what it's important to remember when I say the word, which you probably know, um, is it's a figment of our imagination, right? I cannot go get stigma from the car. It doesn't actually exist. It's not a thing that I can bring up here and introduce to you all and say this is stigma and we need to deal with it um, because it's very annoying um, and it's causing all of those things, isolated humans and families. It's causing us to deny fatal illnesses um, and it's causing a huge cost in our society. And so when we think about stigma, there's two main types. We have public stigma um, and that is our society's decision that certain people, topics, or things are a stigmatized thing, right? So that might mean um, that we say a certain group of people are stigmatized. A certain group of people who drive a certain car could be stigmatized. If we all got together and decided we don't like that, right? Um, but we do it when it comes to mental health, right? We say people with mental health disorders are stigmatized people. We, we talk down about them. We use colloquial terms every day to acknowledge that stigma, like we call people crazy. We have a bad day and we just say, you know, I just, I just thought about ending it all. I'm just going to kill myself, right? Which people have done, and so it's not exactly a joke or something we should take casually. Um, and we definitely do it when it comes to substance use. We um, very regularly use terms in our society to isolate. We say, those people, right? Those people are different than me. And when we say that, it means I'm better than those people, right? Um, because we've made a distinction between ourselves and them. Whether we're doing it intentionally or not, it's still something that's happening. Um, and public stigma is bad, but self-stigma is even worse. And that's when an individual <coughs> internalizes that public level of stigma and says, I'm one of those people, which means it's not worth it. 
I'm not going to go get help. I'm not going to seek treatment. I'm going to deny any of these symptoms or problems because I can't make a difference in my life. It's just not worth it because I'm one of those people and I deserve to let them die as we read online or in other places. So that self stigma is internalized. Um, and one of the most frustrating things is when we actually study barriers to access and treatment, what things keep people from seeking effective treatment for mental health, for substance use, for divorce, for all types of things. Um, we know that the largest barrier, once we deal with transportation, formal barriers, transportation, insurance, costs, um, lack of ability to get there if it's not in your community or county. Um, when we deal with those, the largest barrier to seeking treatment is an individual's perceived self-stigma. The higher they rank their experience of stigma and their belief that they're not worth it and that internalized belief, the less likely they are to seek treatment. And then we're doing some interesting research around that right now to see um, how that might change through time in a program. Um, and see, uh, we know that it correlates with things like self-sabotage, right? If you believe you can't do something, you're not going to try and do it. And when it starts to look like you are, that fear kicks in, um, that helplessness, and you say, forget it, I'm not even going to bother. Um, and so that internalized stigma shows up as well. Um, and so it is known as one of our top barriers to accessing treatment. So what can we do? Well, um, one thing that I always say is, we're not gonna solve this problem overnight. We didn't get here overnight. Um, and in fact, it's, it's not really an opioid epidemic, I hate to say that. Um, and it's not necessarily a substance epidemic, it's a trauma epidemic. Um, the root line cause of this is going to cause another epidemic after it and after it and after it. Um, if we don't treat those underlying causes, those social determinants of health. Um, but what small things can we do every day to make a difference or to change the language around this? And so um, this does not come from me. This is a white paper released um, by the last drug czar, not our local state drug czar, but the federal um, drug czar, who is Michael Botticelli. He's an individual in long-term recovery. Um, and he works now in Massachusetts um, he's with one of the public health schools up there um, and uh, councils. Um, and he talks a lot about how can we change the language around this. And so he made an initiative uh, within the federal government to change the language within SAMHSA and, and uh, NIDA and NIH um, to change the terms that we're using. He advocates to say the research shows that the language we use to describe this disease can either perpetuate or overcome stereotypes, prejudice, and lack of empathy that keep people from getting treatment. Evidence demonstrates it's a disease caused by a variety of genetic and environmental factors, not a moral weakness on the part of the individual, and it goes on to say, and our language should reflect that. Um, and so what's a, my embarrassing fact of the day, which I'll share other than being late, um, is that I met Michael Botticelli recently at a, a National League of Cities conference, completely fangirled out, like got, was very flustered. Um, the mayor threw me really far under the bus and literally did the introduction and was like, she's obsessed with you. I was like, thank you so much for that. Um, and I proceeded to make the matters worse by quoting him to himself. Um, but so if it's any consolation, that did happen. And so that is true, and this is something we were able to talk a lot about. And he really does advocate um, changing this language. These are four of the guidelines they released. Um, and they went so far as to change the AP style book. Um, so I know you haven't thought about that since freshman English or AP English, um, where you had to go out and buy that style guide that told you how and what to write. Um, that universal sort of uh, language and standard, they actually changed that. Um, they included now a section on removing stigmatizing language. Um, and so they said, remove it in regards to mental health, remove it in regards to race and gender, um, and all these other factors, and then they single out substance use. Um, so we want to make sure that we're using that language. It means that we first use person-first language. The reason this matters, not only for the individual with a substance use disorder, language is it matters for those kids. Um, when kids hear us talk about their mom who's an addict or a junkie, um, but they have that conflicting feeling of, but that's my mommy. Um, and we're referring to that language or terminology. We also see it with kids who grow up and they tell us, I do trainings in our schools uh, sometimes, and I had the opportunity um, after training, a kid came up to me and said, well, I'm a drug baby. Right? So that was a 12 year old um, who had internalized that narrative so strongly that that's what they self-identified as, right? That is not a good thing, right? If you've ever heard of positive affirmations, no one ever said, get lipstick out and write on your mirror, I'm a drug baby, I have hope and promise in the future, right? One of those we'd want to take out of there. Um, and so those language uh, perpetuates our culture and it's things we hear. 
So we want to use person first language when it comes to substance use or mental health, or really anything. You're an individual with depression. You're not a depressed person. It's very damning. It's very uh, said and done. Um, you're not just an addict or a junkie, chair, light, table, right? All of those sounded like an inanimate object. Um, and so we want to focus on that, the fact that they're still a human in a sentence. Whether we're super happy with them or not still makes them a person. Um, and it really matters because those kids pick up on that language really, really quickly, right? Um, in our residential program, I, I'm going to start our own show that we'll have to like, hit a code or something, but kids say the darndest things. Um, we have little two-year-olds who say some of the darndest things um, about mom's uh, drug use or history of drug use, and they're aware of that. And so the language we use within that program matters because it's what they're hearing and picking up every day. So this is sort of a lot, but these are the suggested guidelines for altering our language. Um, I will just say that infants are not born addicted. Infants are born exposed. Infants are born with withdrawal symptoms. Addiction is a formal diagnosis that involves self-control um, and the lack thereof around a substance um, or anything, in fact. We are addicted to our cell phones. Um, we are addicted to other things in life, coffee, um, sugar, uh, salt, carbs, all these sorts of things we can be addicted to because of the formal definition. But infants are not born addicted. Um, and so we need to change that terminology and be medically accurate um, because we don't uh, promote non-medically accurate uh, terminology in other areas of our life. So what can we do? Well, small changes in our language can impact those around us. We can start to just say, it takes no, it's a little bit longer um, in a sentence, but it's no harder really to say <coughs> individual with a substance use disorder. An individual not yet in recovery, um, and, or an individual in long-term recovery. That's the way that we most commonly identify that. Um, so we want to use that person-centered language. Um, and if we don't necessarily do it um, for the people we're working with, which would be a good group of people to do it for, um, it actually impacts our well-being. When we sit and think about something as sort of being um, sort of damned if we do it, damned if we don't, that idea that it's not going to make a difference. They are who they are. This is the way it is. Um, it really depresses us. It's hard to be in a helping profession um, where you think about that person as just this thing. Um, they're always that thing. Um, but if we add some hope into that sentence, we actually can show that it changes the way we think about that thing. Um, it changes our own satisfaction with what we're doing. Um, so being aware of those own connections we're making in our own life. So to formalize that definition of what I've been referring to this time, a substance use disorder, the medical diagnosis, um, meets certain criteria within the ICD-10 codes, the medical codes, um, or our DSM-5 codes. Um, and that is a substance use disorder is defined as a chronic relapsing brain disease. It has three criteria of addiction, which include craving of the object, loss of control over its use, and continued involvement despite adverse consequences. So when we think of addiction, I remind you that it's not just a substance. Um, I recently had one of those catastrophic Apple failures um, and had to go without my iPhone for, it was about eight days. Um, it was a significant withdrawal in my life. I would wake up and pick up the inanimate object that literally could do nothing, but it was still the first thing in the morning. Oh, okay, I can do anything. I got anxious while driving because like, what if something happens and I'm on the highway and I don't, you know, I can't call anyone. Like, we used to live like that all the time. I remember my mom gave me a quarter um, when she dropped me off at swim practice, like, call me on the payphone. Um, so we were able to survive, but I absolutely went through withdrawals from my cell phone. So sometimes we're quick to say someone else's addiction is worse than our own, and it absolutely can be. The consequences can be. Um, but being aware that that is the criteria for addiction, that continued use loss of control and um, craving of that object. Um, so there's ex exactly two different symptoms in the following categories to diagnose substance use, impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and then it has to include that pharmacological criteria of tolerance or withdrawal. One important thing to note there is that some people are dependent on something but not necessarily addicted to that thing. It hasn't crossed into that. So we have low risk use, moderate risk, high risk, dependence, um, and then that movement um, to the full substance use disorder. Um, and so that might be people are dependent in some cases on a medication that is prescribed to them and is being maintained by a doctor. But if anyone is on a benzodiazepine, you are dependent on that 
because should you titrate off of that drug without medical assistance, you will experience withdrawal. It's just how those drugs manifest in our body. And so um, if someone is on a Xanax, you need to withdraw off that. You cannot just go from zero to nothing. That can actually kill you. Um, and so that would be dependency, but it's not a substance use disorder, right? That's a medically controlled um, use of that drug. So what actually happens? Well, we could spend the next uh, two days on this um, slide alone. And then we have folks who that's all they do is really study this piece of it. Um, and so what we know is um, that certain drugs hijack the brain more rapidly than others. Um, and so that can occur whether it was initial use or uh, was experimenting or initial use was prescribed by a physician. Um, and so what occurs most simply is that the brain is flooded with dopamine, which is something we all actually naturally produce. But within this room, we all produce different levels of it. Um, so some of us naturally produce high levels of dopamine. Some of us produce relatively low levels of dopamine naturally. Um, and so that's one of those initial factors that we don't know about someone when we go to prescribe a medication. Um, so dopamine is a neurotransmitter. It's what controls our reward center of the brain. Um, and it's actually the part of the brain that tells us to eat, sleep, procreate, get pleasure out of picking up our children. Um, all of those factors are controlled by our dopamine. So things like postpartum depression, when um, an individual does not receive satisfaction out of those things, is an imbalance in their neurotransmitters. It actually makes them slightly more susceptible to developing some of these substance use disorders because the artificial dopamine that comes with that drug is gonna flood that brain um, and give that same sense of happiness, but it's artificially placed there. Um, so the brain is flooded with dopamine. Um, it's gonna affect that ability to um, engage naturally. And what happens, unfortunately, is that your brain stops then producing the natural dopamine it was doing in the first place. So you become dependent on that drug. That's why if you take an opioid and an opioid and an opioid, um, some people within 48 hours can show signs of dependency. Their brain has turned off those dopamine receptors or dropped them down dramatically. Um, and so the brain does not naturally then produce it. They feel that need for um, the craving of the object. Um, they're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. And they start to show those symptoms of withdrawal. Um, and so over time, um, other individuals, it might take seven days. We know there's a huge spike in that five to seven day period of people who start to show signs of dependency, specifically on opioids. Um, but that other drugs might show that as well, whether it's methamphetamines, um, cocaine, or benzodiazepines, how they're all reacting with that pleasure center of the brain differs. Um, we also know that um, when we talk specifically around opioids or substance use disorders as a whole, um, I regularly hear someone say to me, you know, well, about three years ago when this all started. Nope. Um, we know that our first spike um, was in the 90s. So the first time that this rate went up dramatically, um, we are showing a hot spot, I believe on this one I included, that's 08. Um, so that's 08, um, 2012, um, and then 2014. And those hot spots um, existed back in 08. We actually, got a 08 map looks virtually similar um, to 02 and 04. Um, and so that two, four, and eight map all look very similar. And we were already in a hot spot. This is not a new epidemic. This is not a new crisis. It's also not just in Appalachia, right? Um, it's something that as a stigmatized community as a whole, um, we are a part of. And so it's much easier for the national um, framework to have a conversation around those people in Appalachia <coughs> and their drug problem, right? Um, and then as a state, we like to do it even more. Cabot County and Huntington, that's the only place we have a drug problem, right? Um, not true, I travel all over the states, definitely not accurate. Um, and we can see from these maps that that's not accurate. Um, so 22.5 million Americans, 12 and older, currently have substance use disorders. Um, that's about 90,000 deaths annually. Notice that we start tracking at 12 and up. I don't have to tell anyone who's ever worked with children for any period of time that we are missing a group of people who already have substance use disorders if we don't start counting until they turn 12. Um, we uh, talk to people at the harm reduction program and they self-report age of first use and we see a spike at nine. So if we are waiting till 12, we are way too late um, to be talking about this conversation. If we wait to have drug education in our high schools, we're also way too late um, for that population. 
We know that with um, individuals with the most prolonged and severe use, we see age of first use much earlier. We have people reporting use five, six, seven, eight. Um, and so taking a drug, being given a drug by someone, it being used, unfortunately, in regards to abuse um, or being used in regards to sex trafficking, another issue that we, we rarely confront. Um, and so being aware of how that might occur and, and talking to people early and often about that substance use disorder. I'll also just point out that those early maps, yeah, those early maps told us something that we didn't notice at the time. That region of the uh, United States, Appalachia, <laughs> and in Florida, um, all had hotspots. So there, over there, and down there. And if we'd actually taken a second and looked at this um, at the time, we would have noticed something about those three communities. They're not often covered in snow, except today. Um, or two of them are not ever really covered in snow. They're somewhere nice and sunny, where snowbirds like to flock to. Um, and they're an area where a lot of people might retire to. The fastest growing population in the United States with substance use disorders specific to opioids are individuals over the age of 60. So if we looked at our data back then, we would have seen something in the prescribing habits um, of the United States. West Virginia and Appalachia falls in there because we were one of the fastest aging communities beyond uh, regions where people move to um, to retire. And so that would have indicated something around prescribing habits. It would also have indicated um, something about the treatment of chronic pain and injuries um, and the ability to access those medications in those communities. Um, so again, something always just, there's always something else out there um, interesting to note in our data. So this um, is our overdose statistics. I gave you the clean data, which is the ones that have been validated by the CDC. Um, for example, in Cabo County, I can pull our data from yesterday. Um, I can work with EMS and our folks to get that up-to-date data, um, along with our um, harm reduction program and our health department. Uh, as a state, we do, I do this very nicely, a horrible <laughs> job of collecting data rapidly um, and getting it clean immediately. The way that we process data is basically the opposite of every other state. There's a few others that do it like us, and we're always the last to submit any data or reports. Um, and so what we know is that um, that just delays our knowledge of funding um, communities and uh, the way that we can pursue other sorts of grants or federal uh, help. So I, I did put Cabell County up there, um, and the reason I'm pulling Cabell County is because we are the county that has seen a vast flip in the past um, nine months, but documented six months. Um, and this data has been released. So in 2015, we had 480 overdose deaths, 2016, 1,200, and 2017, 1,800. Um, and that 1,800 was a huge uh, drop in what was expected. So when you actually track data like that, what we're seeing is a trend line. 480 to 1,200 is a pretty huge jump, right? Um, but 1,800 should have been vastly over 2,000. Um, and so what we saw there was a continued rise in overdoses, but a reduction in overdose deaths. And now what we're seeing is a reduction in both. Um, so in the first six months of 2017, um, there were 953 overdoses, not deaths. Um, and in the first six months of 2018, we saw 564. So now we've seen a drop both in our overdoses and our overdose deaths. Um, so that first piece has contributed to some things. There's tons of factors that go into this. One is that we've installed a continuum of care. We now have actually services that spread that continuum with open access to medication-assisted treatment, naloxone, Narcan, all of those services are readily available. Proact, one-stop shop, treatment for women and children, so we're, we're reducing those barriers. Um, we also know that there's less fun things to talk about. Methamphetamine rates are on the rise, um, and people do not overdose in the same fashion on methamphetamine as they do um, on a depressant substance like an opioid. Um, and so that is playing a role in some of this. We've seen, unfortunately, that trend go back to a little bit of what we used to um, in the 80s and 90s called speedballing. Um, so having a depressant followed by a stimulant um, in that cycle of that uh, experience. Um, we do know that, unfortunately, as a state, we continue to struggle with neonatal abstinence syndrome or neonatal opioid withdrawal symptoms. Um, both of those are the correct terms around that. Uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome in Cabell County um, is incredibly high, which is 62.3 for every uh, 1,000 live births. <coughs> the reason that's so high in Cabell County is because we have the neonatal treatment unit. Um, so at any given time, um, the births in Cabell County and the infants in our NTU 
are only 50% from West Virginia. So Ohio and Kentucky um, come over to have an, uh, an infant there because they might be in a medication assisted treatment program or they know that that's gonna be the best care for that child. And so that census automatically drives up our infants with neonatal abstinence syndrome. <coughs> and then we know that a large majority of our uh, families are coming from beyond Cabell County. Um, so even, for example, right now at Project Hope, um, out of the eight families, um, two would be considered Cabell County residents and that's because they were homeless and at the mission. Um, before they came into the program. And so um, all of the others at this point currently are not um, primary residents of Cabell County. Uh, so that sort of uh, drives up that rate of hole in our region. Um, we can also see that there's been long ongoing trends when it comes to heroin, our synthetic opioids, that's fentanyl and carfentanyl, um, and then our prescribed opioids and tracking them differently and separately. We can see that that uh, increase in overdose deaths is directly correlated to that synthetic opioid rise. Um, so what are some of those trends? Well, uh, methamphetamine use is absolutely on the rise. Um, we know that um, it is coming in and uh, people are requiring the distribution of both heroin and methamphetamine um, to an individual who is attempting to purchase drugs, um, which is a new um, and uh, difficult trend to, to manage and deal with. Um, so methamphetamine use is not the what we were dealing with historically, sort of shake and bake. We really, um, when I talked to Chief Dial in Huntington, um, I think they've had like one meth lab bust um, in quite a few years. It's not that old school production of meth. Um, that might be done at a small level, but it is uh, sort of cartel grade meth. Um, and so we're dealing with that level of drug production. So it's not being made here in West Virginia, it's being imported um, into West Virginia. Um, so individuals withdrawing from meth are going to have a severe um, decrease in their dopamine and are going to present highly and very depressed um, for a uh, prolonged period of time. Um, so the other issue around this is fentanyl or carfentanyl that caused the increased spike of overdoses. And if you can see there in the, the dot, that tiny black dot is morphine, the red dot is heroin, this orange dot is fentanyl, and that yellow dot is carfentanil. So the tiny black one, the red one, orange, and the giant yellow. That's equal dosing of those drugs. That's why if there is a small amount of either fentanyl or carfentanil mixed in with heroin, um, people are dropping on the spot. Um, and so you see that literal use and people uh, go out because they did not know that that potent drug was mixed in. Um, the largest importer of fentanyl into the United States is the US Postal Service. Um, it is predominantly shipped in from China. Um, as it was not a controlled drug, it was made synthetically, um, it was made uh, in their labs um, and was being imported in the United States. Not through like clean mail, um, but if you watch one episode of Border Patrol, you would see that it's incredibly hard um, for them to keep up with the creative and inventive ways. And if they scanned every piece of your mail, it would never get to you. Like if all of the mail that came in the United States had to be gone through with uh, drug sniffing or this, the level of technology necessary, we would just never get international mail, which might be good for some of us who just get scared. So um, that's the, the level of potency that we're dealing with when we talk about these trends. So people will say to me, so how did this happen? Why did it happen in West Virginia? Um, but how did this happen nationally? We know that there's a, quite a few factors and I'll address some of them individually, but um, the United States, for example, is one of the only countries that allows direct marketing of pharmaceuticals to consumers. Ask your doctor, right? Um, so you have blank, blank, and blank. Well, I didn't before, but I definitely do now. You should ask your doctor, right? I mean, if you've ever looked up your symptoms on WebMD and gone from thinking you had the common cold to you will be dead within the next 24 hours, um, that sort of process unfortunately happens. Those of us who might um, have a little bit higher education or know about uh, what drugs can do might know, well, I don't necessarily need that right now, right? Um, but a lot of folks, we have unfortunately created a society of the quick fix. If you don't feel well, there's a pill for that. Um, and you can take something and it will eradicate those symptoms and you'll feel much better instantly. Um, and so that direct marketing and that sort of perception of that as a whole um, and uh, has created some of this context. Um, we have a lack of behavioral health care. We have um, the highest shortage of mental health providers um, in West Virginia. Uh, I, for example, I'm a licensed large family therapist, like that was said. Um, there's just about none of those in West Virginia. We are separate, we are not counseling or social work um, or psychology, it's a separate degree. 
Um, and West Virginia, again, really lacks that. Again, we lack social work psychology and all those other factors as well. So we don't have integrated health care um, that can help catch some of these symptoms and reduce the overprescribing. Um, and then unfortunately, our healthcare system is vastly undereducated about the effects or damaging effects of substance use disorders. Um, and that's not my report, that's the Surgeon General. Um, did an investigation of med schools across the country, found that the majority included less than 10 hours of education around substance use, addiction, dependency, withdrawals, or treatment. Um, and that a large number of them included approximately one hour of education on that topic. And so our providers are not aware of the risk factors, and in some cases, of these. And so that education is coming from other um, uh, access points um, of those people distributing those drugs in many cases. The other factors I'm going to touch on specifically. Uh, one is uh, we created a perfect storm, um, and that was the introduction of these two things simultaneously. Uh, it was uh, thought that the pain scale was introduced into our healthcare system organically uh, through the Veterans Administration. That's where it seemed to come, and that was introduced to JCO. Um, what we now know is that it was lobbied for um, by the pharmaceutical industry, specifically knowing um, that Oxycontin was about to drop on the market. Um, and so these two things came about, and they just seemed to both randomly appear on the market, um, and that is not accurate. And so, unfortunately, the reason it became a problem is that the pain scale is tied to financial reimbursement for hospitals and insurance. So if you go into a hospital and you report you have pain, um, and every uh, appointment is required to show you that pain scale, that's not mine, that's not some cartoon I found, that is the actual pain scale. Um, it hangs just up the hallway from my office. Um, and so that, that is the measurement that they are basing things on, and they ask people um, to report their pain on that level. If, do you guys want to go for a quick five minute break and then come right back in so that we can keep this going? Do you all need to take a break? Do you need the hokey Keep going. All right, let's take a quick five minute break. You guys keep up. Sorry. <laughs> Most guys don't need 